Hello everyone, my name is Gaia Novarino. I am from the Fans Cavalier Network uh, and uh, from the IC Austria. And today I'm chairing this session about uh, um, a pandemic and uh, neuroscientists. So we are not going to talk about neuroscience, I think, uh, of, of, the, of the pandemic. I think for that uh, we'll really need many more years. Um, but so what we are going to talk about, uh, what the speakers uh, are going to talk about, is about uh, um, the, their initiatives in the context of the pandemic. So each speaker will um, um, focus on their uh, uh, initiatives and at the end we will have, uh, um, we can take a few questions. So our uh, first speaker is uh, Anna. Anna, maybe uh, you want to start uh, um, sharing your, uh, your screen. So Anna Olila is from the uh, LCK University and also the MBL group also, uh, at in LCK. So um, thank you, Hanna, for speaking, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. And um, I'm a group leader at the University of Helsinki, and on my day job, I work with severe neurological disorders, especially those that are triggered by an immune component, such as type 1 narcolepsy. And what I want to talk about today is really if you have a scientific finding, how, like, and especially in COVID 19 um, or other infectious triggers that affect health, um, how can you convey that message to the decision making um, people? Because they are not necessarily the same scientists that you work with on your um, daily job. And the first thing um, I just want to briefly say is that the formal decisions, they need evidence and experience with earlier infectious disease uh, specialists as well. And they are based on novel findings in COVID-19. And what these people usually are is that they are working within government institutions and they are professors, for example, in um, government in institution research centers or universities, and usually they are professors, but also um, important information from other domains, such as social sciences and economic uh, sciences and human rights, needs to go in to the decision-making process. And in addition to that, um, there are a number of individual researchers, such as us, uh, who make discoveries that are relevant and that are novel, that should be somehow conveyed to those people um, who make the decisions. And the good thing about like being a researcher during this time is that um, you need to report the no novel findings that you have, but you don't have to make the final decision, but um, conveying that message clearly is definitely a key. So what I would say is the main, um, main uh, purpose of researchers currently is that we need to communicate uh, the novel findings and those findings pretty often actually change the dogma and change the way that we, un that we treat or understand about COVID. And therefore it needs to be uh, conveyed very clearly and early when the decisions uh, can still be made based on those novel findings. And how we can do that is through preprints and articles that is probably the most uh, familiar way of communicating these novel findings. But then also uh, through uh, groups that inform officials and the public. And in Finland, we have this erankoronasta.fi that has been promoting uh, science-based um, novel findings uh, and has been communicating how we think as uh, researchers uh, what steps ne would need to, to be taken in uh, decision making. Um, the other option is of course also talking directly to health officials and many of us um, know directly health officials and just like uh, conveying these messages through social media groups that inform both officials and public and through preprints and articles make sure that findings themselves when they are kind of like uh, somewhat solidified um, they are based on proof and there is time to react and what I want to say next is that there are a couple of examples where our thinking in this disease has changed. For example, it was very surprising um, that the disease, first of all, came to Europe and the rest of the world uh, from Asian countries, because um, that has not been the case so uh, strongly with uh, 
previous SARS uh, viruses or MERS viruses. And then, um, excuse me, oops, I lost my. Um, sorry. Yeah. So you can now go ahead. I can't go ahead on my presentation. Maybe you want to unshare and uh, share again the screen. Um, I can't get my mouse work actually. Okay. Um, maybe from the technical side is, uh, let's see if, uh, I can stop your the share the, the screening of your uh, the, the, the sharing of your screen actually. Yes, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, but now I, I have to. Oh, perfect. Let's see if now. So now, now I, I can share it. again. Now it's, it should be working again. Let's yes. Try. Thanks. Yeah, so some of these examples that kind of like uh, have changed the dogma was that there was, a, first of all, the rapid and surprising spread outside Asia. And then all, early reports also showed very many similarities to the flu and or similar patterns to H1N1 that I actually study on my day job. And these have um, kind of like um, resulted in somewhat um, skewed um, estimates for fatality and transmission. And currently also like these estimates develop so that there are uh, these super spreading events and aerosol mediated transmission that are under uh, very strong investigation by the scientific uh, groups. So, and the list goes on, of course. So what I think um, the importance of the public here is that eventually individuals uh, in the public need to know where we're going uh, with the pandemic because it's really the individuals also who make the difference because uh, they are the ones and all of us are the ones who wash their hands or uses a mask or practices social distancing and therefore i also want to stress that even though many people have different opinions what are the um, next correct actions, everyone still wants to end the pandemic. And that's good to uh, keep in mind, especially if you disagree um, on the next steps that should be taken in controlling the pandemic. And I think that within FENS, um, the domain expertise is needed because there are um, chances to, if you share your results early, um, there's chance to actually affect and make a difference in decision making. And one of the key um, things that we're now beginning to see is the long term side effects of COVID-19. And of course, rare side effects will be well rare. So they need large cohorts um, just to be detected. So it's essential to collaborate within the scientific efforts. And early preprints of discoveries uh, should be really encouraged. And you can always complete uh, a larger study combining two preprints to make the, the paper more valuable at the end. But share, getting these um, findings out, I think, is very essential. And now, if ever, there is great opportunity to really make a difference. And with that, I would like to end. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. So we have to quickly move to our second speaker, Susanne Schreiber from the Humboldt University. Susanne, please uh, share your screen. Thank you. Susanne, you have to unmute yourself. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Sorry for this. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I want to take the point of view of the neuroscientist here and to show a little bit how it can affect us, COVID-19, not in terms of the medical disease, but in terms of how we behave as neuroscientists. And for that, um, I can say that I've, I'm very happy to be a member of the Fence Company Network, as is Gaia too, and as Claire is too. 
and the network really showed that we have loads of responsible people out there. Of course, this is not restricted to the network, but we realized that at the very beginning, and we had an outburst um, of conversations in our WhatsApp groups and so on, that everybody really tried to get engaged and was thinking about how to contribute to fighting this disease. And I just want to point out here that we had um, we were sharing the latest insights, um, we were discussing how to communicate science, how to argue publicly against some of the wild theories, how to improve testing, and some people even have implemented tests in their own lab and changed basically what they were doing. And um, we had discussions on how to create efficient masks and how to advise governments from testing strategies to school reopenings. And this is something I also got involved in into this political part because it just happened that I've been appointed in April to serve in the National Ethics Council. So I think the official name is the German Ethics Council. And that's um, yeah, a council of 24 people nominated by the government and by parliament. Um, and they are usually there to advise the, the politicians on ethical issues. So we are philosophers, we are people from law, we are theologists, and a very few life scientists too. And at the same time, um, as I was appointed there, our German Minister of Health, Mr. Jens Spahn, whom you can see here on the right-hand side, um, he gave the first official request to this council, and that is how to use so-called immunity passports. And that has kept us busy since, and it's an interesting topic because, not sure all of you are aware of it, but I think most of you may have seen this in the press, Immunity passports can represent an interesting means, certainly not the only one, but an interesting means to fight the pandemic a little bit. And so what are immunity passports? Imagine you have survived COVID-19 and you can assume that you are immune. Let me tell you, that's currently not established yet, right? We don't know yet, but let's just imagine for the moment that you are. Then the question arises, can you return to a normal life? Not everyone will be immune yet, right? But, but what does that mean? So can you be issued a passport and that will relieve you from restrictive measures, um, will allow you to travel again, no, you don't have to practice social distancing anymore. Um, will this also mean that you may have special obligations because you're immune, you may be given special tasks. And is this, or would this be for everyone or only for selected groups? And in the media, this is um, debated, very highly debated. There are many people who are against it. There are people who are in favor of it. And it's really an ethical issue. So um, when we founded, or when I, when I entered the Ethics Council, we founded a small group of six to 10 people, and we started discussing, and I volunteered for this group. It's been a lot of fun. It's been really um, very intense. And I realized that, you know, although this is not my main expertise, I should say I'm a computational neuroscientist, but um, you can really contribute to, um, yeah, you, you can you do your contribution to fighting the disease, even on this political level, because the outcome of what we do there will be something that will influence politicians. They don't have to follow it, our advice, but they will for sure listen to it in the sense that um, they read it and then they will really consider it. And I became, as you can see, something what we call in German and a person of conviction, an Überzeugungstäter. Um, there isn't a really adequate translation for that in English, um, but that mean, means I put in a lot of time and worked with this really interdisciplinary people. So I read a lot of papers. We do have to do a lot of science communications among the scientists in the panel, but also to politicians. Um, we have been contacting experts. I've been talking to a lot of high-ranking immunologists, virologists, and so on. Um, you learn from your colleagues in other fields because this is not just a medical question. It, it has, involves the law, it involves philosophy, all kinds of social sciences. Um, and as I mentioned already, I invested a lot amount of time in it. So um, it's also challenging when you do this because you have to keep kind of your own science running, your family running, and then you do this too. But I think in these exceptional times, you need to take exceptional measures. And I want to encourage you, if you have an opportunity like this, go ahead, because although you, you're the expert in your own science, you can go beyond and you can contribute to society. So my main message is down here, you kind of this year, COVID-19 forces us to see that we have to take over responsibility as scientists for the society. I think this is very much along the lines that Hannah was presenting and also outside the very core of our, our expertise. This is challenging, but I think we should dare it and then we can actually have a real impact on society potentially. I hope so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susanna, for this very nice message and for uh, your experience. 
So our next, uh, the next speaker is Claire Vallard from also Fans Cavalry Network and the AICM. So in France, um, so Claire, uh, please go ahead, share your screen. And okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about something uh, slightly different, but in the same line that what we just heard actually with Susanna. Um, I started a website called Adios Corona uh, when uh, I was in uh, lockdown, like many of you. And uh, the idea was similar that even though we're not experts in you know, virology, epidemiology, uh, or um, immunology, we are actually scientists who, who think carefully and can analyze and get also the advice of experts who are really too busy to really dedicate their time to outreach in order to uh, really get people to understand what we know and what we don't know about SARS-CoV-2, how does it propagate, and how we can best stop um, the propagation of COVID-19. So um, uh, the effort we, we promote was uh, done really in order to make it very simple for the population to understand what we know and what we don't know and why there are sometimes controversies even in science. So the motivation of doing, you know, another website is really due to the fact that there is misinformation from the media, we've all suffered from it, and that the official government have economical and political constraints. Many scientific websites, such as the one of KU Love and for instance, are extremely useful for scientists, but they're really not accessible for the public. And so with this in mind, we really wanted to put an effort and we think that actually neuroscientists are quite tuned to make the effort of you know, understanding interdisciplinary research. Uh, some concepts are very difficult to grasp. They need to know a bit of modeling and understand exponential growth, superpropagation, dispersion, coefficient, how does it work? Um, and, and we need to really solve apparent contradiction that really reflect poorly on scientists. And, and we really need to reach out more to the population. So our goal was really to inform people in order to understand and reflect for themselves by providing them facts and that's how we're a little bit different from most science, science outreach uh, websites. We provide the facts and the reasoning behind so that we can really uh, argue for practical advice that will enable people to go back to a social life, but in a safe manner. We always rely and provide all scientific sources. We admit when the knowledge is lacking, and we illustrate also how countries implement different rules uh, for testing, for social distancing, which result in very different numbers that need to be taken into account when we're evaluating how good different countries have been doing or you know, how the disease has been propagating. So the website is organized in two parts. The first part is understand. Uh, and so we simply explain what we know and don't know about COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2. We have now covered over 100 questions and we're working on many more. Uh, we release them when they are ready. And then the second part of the website is really about acting. So how can we best act in order to stop the propagation of COVID-19 and be able to have a safe and sane social life together? And so the image that you're seeing are coming from headquarters uh, and they are illustrating actions and scenarios of how we should handle things such as going back to work, doing our shopping, being in the elevator, dancing, and, and things like that. So it's a real team effort. Uh, I started this initiative together with Virginie Orgogozo courtier you see here on the top right. And the two of us started doing most of the writing in the very first week of, of lockdown. And then what was really nice is to get a huge amount of help from many, many scientists. Now we have over 25 scientists writing q and A, and we have uh, at least the same number, in fact, more scientists translating it because the website exists in 10 languages. We verify information from experts in virology, epidemiology, immunology, and other, in fact, physicists for you know, aerosol distribution and questions like that. So we've been really benefiting from the team effort that gave a lot of hope as well during lockdown. This uh, effort was again supported by the Fence Cavalry Network of Excellence, where some of the uh, scientists have in, in particular helped for the translation, um, Max Josh, for instance, with Spanish, or Yota Apanati for, for Greek. Um, we have a very importantly, a very careful editing method. One contributor suggests a question, and then reads article, propose outlines, start working on it, and then we verify. So our process is extremely slow. 
We never publish anything when we're not sure, but it's, it's very safe. And that's how we made it really reliable. So we don't communicate about hydroxychloroquine until we have good evidence to say something important and interesting. Uh, we, we really waited until the data was there to talk about solar illumination. And you know, we are careful about talking, for instance, about his night of COVID-19. We uh, benefited from my brother, Olivier Wyatt at Quarter for all the graphical design and Uzai Girid for the website. And we have uh, come out with an evaluation of the risk. So for many situations, including vacation in the summer, family reunion, uh, you can go to the website and evaluate your own risk uh, in order to see you know, how you should handle any kind of situation, in fact, based on type of interaction uh, and, uh, and so on that you will have with people. This website has been uh, translated, as I said, in, in 10 languages. I'd like to really thank the uh, Fence Cavalry Network and all the people really who helped us uh, translating. It's a huge amount of effort. And if you want to contribute, you're welcome to contact me. We're looking for more people to, to contribute. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um... We should uh, speed up or, or not, but uh, uh, Mahmoud uh, Aboukar is uh, our next speaker from the University of Sussex. Sussex. And uh, so the floor is yours. Take your time, of course. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I, I thank you very much, uh, Gail, for the introduction and thanks, Kavli Network, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, so I'll be giving you an African uh, science communication perspective, especially due to the current COVID epidemic. Uh, that is going on. Um, so, uh, as you all know, we are fighting two pandemics, the COVID-19 real pandemic and then the infodemic that is going on. And this is particularly uh, challenging in Africa because, uh, you know, you receive a lot of messages on social media, WhatsApp, ETC, with a lot of things that you can do to uh, get yourself protected from COVID-19, for example. So it's difficult to tell what is fact and what is fake. And perhaps this is also because we have low number of scientists in many African countries, but at the same time, it's probably because we have an existing cultural and religious misconception about science. So as scientists, what can we do? We've heard about the different things that we can do, but one of these things that we can actually do is to organize public engagement activities to raise awareness about science. And especially because as a neuroscientist, I don't know much about SARS-CoV-2, but I can use my skills to organize, get events going so that we can help in defeating this pandemic. So uh, actually the a story about my science communication started since 2013. I joined Trend in Africa, which is an NGO that promotes science in Africa, founded by Lucia and Tom, Fans Cavalry Network Fellows. And uh, since joining in 2013, I launched the outreach program, we've got over 90 members across Africa and we've organized over 80 events in the last uh, couple of years in more than 10 African countries. And through these activities, we kind of engage students, the public, as well as decision makers. Um, in 2018, I launched the Science Communication Hub Nigeria, which focused mostly on Nigeria. And then thanks to Welcome Trust funding in 2019, we launched the African Science Literacy Network. So when this pandemic started, it is clear that we have something that we can offer, especially in defeating COVID infodemic. So um, what we have actually done, uh, for example, with the African Science Literacy Network, so this network is actually comprised of scientists and journalists working together to promote public understanding of science. And when this pandemic started, uh, uh, we created a dedicated page for COVID-19 updates where about, uh, our, about 70 fellows can write articles about COVID-19 in uh, languages that can be understandable to the people. So for example, you, uh, some articles could be in English and some articles in uh, local language like Hausa, which is spoken by about 15 million people, I think in West Africa or in Africa overall. So uh, we have got about 30 articles written by fellows trying to communicate uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, and also dispel misconceptions about it. And this is particularly important because uh, in terms of health crisis like this, in some regions of Africa, people like to, uh, some local people like to trust local scientists. They have more trust uh, for them than scientists living outside the continent. So this is particularly something uh, useful in the context of fighting this epidemic. 
And uh, to do more about this uh, in collaboration with uh, Africa Archive, where we started, uh, we uh, trained as well as African Science Literacy Network, we started this webinar series. And this webinar series basically we invite scientists working on virology as well as those working with the government uh, and at the forefront of fighting this uh, pandemic to come and answer uh, questions about COVID-19, which is live stream on Facebook and YouTube. And um, uh, this is also done in both English and local language. And I think today we've organized about 21 webinars and for the Facebook, uh, pages that I was able to collect some data a few uh, minutes ago. So far, we've had about 20,000 views. And I think if we combine that with the other views in the other websites, we are talking about probably 50,000. And the idea here is that people can come live and answer questions, ask questions, and then the, um, the scientists can answer them. So the advantage of this is that we are kind of um, enhancing the visibility of scientists, but at the same time also, we are enabling the public to hear what local scientists are saying, the advice about how to fight this pandemic, etc. Um, I think in the end, what I would like to say is that although uh, as scientists, I believe that we are the custodians of scientific knowledge and uh, we must do our best to safeguard society from potential harm caused by scientific misinformation and misconceptions. And uh, although we will be neuroscientists, but we'll be able to do a lot of different things to help in fighting this pandemic. I think to end, I would like to thank all people that have funded uh, my work in Africa and in other places, as well as in the UK, some of the science communication activities that I've been doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mamot. Uh, great talk and this great initiative. Um, so first of all, if there is anyone that wants to ask, uh, we have just three minutes left, some question, please uh, write that in the chat. So I have one question. So um, there is one question, how do you think scientists' efforts to communicate to the public, such as the website Adios Corona, could be elevated through government support? And thus, how to obtain a government support? So actually, uh, if I may answer to that one, in, uh, we've been very strongly supported by the government in the sense that the government used our website actually to answer many questions that they were not dealing with because they were overwhelmed. Um, so, so the fact that we were all volunteers and you know taking our time uh, to do this because we were so many actually helped the government a lot to cover questions that they didn't have time to read about. So it's been actually a very huge effort to, to like they really used a lot our website and promoted it. Um, but I think it's also going into the next stage of how should we do best the testing and how should we implement testing in a smart manner? And I think on that one, we're gonna to need to be even more organized and prepared to really think carefully. You know, I think the immune passport is one, but to think about how to really detect the disease and when it's coming and try to really also recover ways to do conferences and training for people on the, you know, together in the same room, confined, we're gonna to have to do smart testing. And I think we're gonna to need to be even more involved. Thank you, Claire. Uh, anyone else wants to add to that? Good, then uh, if not, uh, I mean, I, I would like, I'm actually curious. Uh, so you, you, you told us a bit about what, uh, um, how you got involved eventually, a little bit, uh, and, uh, and, and why. But I'm curious to know about what were the major challenges you faced uh, in, in uh, initiating, I mean, you know, for each of you, um, uh, what was yeah, the main problem? Susanna? Yeah, I can start on this one because it may be similar for everyone. Um, so for me, the biggest challenge, although I'm used to working in an interdisciplinary environment, was to really bridge, stretch out and bridge over to humanities and to, to, to you know, really different, different science um, branches, so to speak. Yeah, and to, to find, the, find the right language, to know where one owns expertise ends, but to, to really get people on board. It's a lot of fun, but it's also very challenging. And the other aspect is that as we have to come to a decision in the end, in my case here with these immunity passports, also taking decisions democratically with more than 20 people, um, I learned a lot there too. Um, anyone else wants to answer, Mahmoud, um, Claire? Anna? Um, yeah, I guess for me, uh, the biggest challenge is 
making sure that I am able to communicate the importance of science to my society without being excommunicated. What I mean by that is that because we have a high level of cultural and religious misconception about science, you have to be careful what you say and how you promote science back where I come from. So that has been a major challenge. And I think to some extent, the COVID-19 pandemic has helped in promoting the idea of the importance of science, which is now going to make it easier for me to continue what I'm doing. I would also say um, that uh, uh, it's a different thing um, if you disagree with scientists because we're um, all used to it on a basically daily basis. Uh, when you dis disagree um, with someone else, uh, you better do it very constructively. I have another question. I mean, we have really one minute left, but uh, I think we can make it. Uh, so what has been the public's response uh, to, uh, for instance, to Adios Corona? And what was the, the country dependent response, which I guess is very interesting. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't put it in the presentation. Uh, it was actually amazing. Like we never got anyone to complain. And I think it's due to what I said before that we, we actually, we had you know, over 200,000 views in a few weeks. Um, really reflecting the fact that many countries among uh, our countries were going to exit lockdown and people were very scared. And what is really incredible is that we, we have a contact form, people contacted us and told us, like, you know, people from any part of society, MDs, many different aspects of the society, they thanked us, sometimes in their own languages, because we've been translating, it was, we had to translate back to understand. But what, what was really good is that they, they thanked us for making it simple. And I think because we didn't tackle questions like when you know maybe the data doesn't look very good and it's not yet sure we didn't tackle those questions we don't want to comment yet when we're not sure and i think that's the main reason why we didn't get any offensive comments because if you talk to other people you know um on, on the issues that were not clear i think it, it it went very very emotional uh so i think it's a very important thing i think we need to be all together for this, even though we are not experts in the exact field, the experts are too busy uh, to really work and do science to understand better the disease. We need to join force and reach out to our own, you know, uh, politicians in order to change the rules, like try to really make it so that we're testing in a smart way to go back to a, also a, a, a collective scientific life where we can have meetings in person. <laughs> in, Thank you, Claire. Um, um, so um, that, that's great. I think probably so we have to close uh, here. Maybe uh, the take home message is that uh, uh, we have a great responsibility as scientists uh, and that we definitely have to work uh, together in any circumstance. Um, so that's what at least what I got, I mean, independently from the single initiatives. So I want to uh, personally thank you uh, all again for uh, um, not just for uh, speaking here, but also for um, your great work. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you again and see you maybe at one point. <laughs> thank you, Gaia. Thank, you. thank you, everyone. Bye, guys.